talking talking back. back. Welcome to Decision Space, the only show to take place right here, here in the space between the turns in your favorite games. I'm Jamie Stegmaier. I'm Jake Friedman. And I'm Brendan Hansen. And this is the podcast about decisions in games. And in today's episode, we're talking about game design problems and how games we admire have solved them. This is kind of a reprise of an episode we did almost two years ago now that we got to delve into a bunch of different topics and we're really excited to cover this topic again. And I think even more excitingly, have an expert guest who we've brought in to really be our ringer and talk about some games he admires as well uh, and how he might approach solving those problems himself. So Jake, I'll let you uh, talk a little bit about our guest today. Yeah, so we're really excited to have our good friend Jamie Stegmeyer back on the podcast. Of course, you know Jamie as the president and CEO of Stonemeyer Games, a designer, a high caliber designer and his owner with games like Scythe and Viticulture, as well as a publisher of some evergreen classics like Wingspan uh, and many other games that you've certainly heard of. So Jamie, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. I think for your third time, we really appreciate it. Welcome. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I, I'm an avid listener of your podcast. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I love the idea of problems and games and how games, some games embrace those problems and find really clever solutions for them. So this is an exciting topic for me to join you for. Sometimes too, I feel like Jamie kind of hopping off that point. And one of the reasons why I think this episode ends up being so fun is oftentimes the games that sort of stick out with solutions, they succeed because they solve sort of the core problem that would prevent that game from kind of popping in its own way. And that's why I love this sort of episode because we get to talk about what's sort of the thing that sets this game apart that we wouldn't normally maybe think of when we think of the game, but oftentimes it just sort of comes to the forefront like, oh yeah, that solved it and it makes way for this game to really click. So it should be cool. For all of our pre-planners, we want to let you know, for those of you who play games at home with us, that we're going to be covering Azul Summer Pavilion in our next Deep Dive episode. That's, of course, one of the games in the Azul line. We covered Base Azul a while ago, but we have more to say about Azul, a really interesting game system. And this new version, new, it's a few years old now, uh, in classic decision space fashion, kind of has a nice twist on the format. So we're going to cover that. It's on Board Game Arena in some way, shape, or form. I don't know if it's on beta, alpha, or full, full release, but if you want to play with us, you can play it there uh, in some way, shape, or form. So the format for this is going to be one of us will present a problem that pops up in games, whether they're games we're playing or games we're trying to design or develop. Uh, and then all three of us have a, sort of a case study to share of a game that we think ingeniously solves that problem through its mechanics or gameplay. Uh, so Brenda, do you want to introduce this first problem and then we can kind of go through our uh, example solutions? Sure. So the problem that I sort of came up with is low interaction games can lack tense moments. And oftentimes I think this is because you don't typically compare scores mid game, uh, but it could be in any other, right? You could have a score tracker and you still might lack some tense moments if you don't have the interaction of creating friction between players that you're sort of is causing you to sort of jump out on the table. Do you guys agree with the sort of framing of this problem? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I'm getting yeah. nods. <laughs> it's something that comes up like in a, in a lot of our games. There are not games with, that have direct conflict, and oftentimes when that happens, a lot of the playtest reports I get back are, "Oh, this game doesn't have enough interaction." And I can mm. go through a list of the interactions in those games, but if the players aren't feeling that, if they're yeah. still saying that, then that means to me that something's going on here that, that they are not feeling that tension that you described. Totally. Well, awesome. I guess I'll jump into a game that came to mind for me that I think solves this in a brilliant way. And it's one we, we recently covered on Decision Space, one that was just nominated for the Spill the R's, and that's Captain Flip. So Captain Flip is a light tile laying game in which you're drawing a tile from a bag, uh, and these tiles come in a, a variety of array of different types. And those types have different rules associated with them. So maybe you want them in uh, different rows than certain other tiles, or maybe they let you claim a special map tile, or maybe they give you points based on the number of other tiles of a certain type that are in your board. Uh, and this, this type of game, is, it's really fun. It's quick. It goes around the table, but it's fairly, it, it lacks a lot of tension outside of this one core mechanism. And I think this tile actually saves the game or doesn't save the game, but it makes way for interesting, tense games that otherwise might just be a little stale on the table. It gives you that memorable moment where you can say to someone after you've played, even if you lost, but I narrowly avoided this massive bust defeat. And that's the gunner mechanism. So the gunner is a tile. It's the most lucrative tile in the game. It gives you five points whenever you place it face on your board. Uh, but 
if you get three or more of these tiles, uh, or if you have three or more of these tiles showing face up on your board at the end of the game, because you can flip tiles in this game, you bust and you lose no matter how many points you have. Uh, so I love this because it creates tension around uh, being willing to push your luck. Uh, maybe you're going to place a third gunner and then look for a monkey tile and desperately hope you draw one later in the game so you can flip an adjacent gunner over. Or maybe you already have two gunners down and you've made the decision to place those fairly early. I know you have to be really careful about which, which tiles you decide to flip uh, going into this middle and later portion of the game. I think it injects uh, a lot of drama that would otherwise be lacking in the game. I think it's a great example. And I think you'd even abstract it a little bit and just kind of talk about a bust mechanism in a game as mm. sort of a way that we can potentially solve for for this problem when we're designing or even the flip side of that. Um, something else we've talked about in this podcast before, a, a mechanism that can lead to sort of crazy jackpots, right? Maybe they sure. don't happen in every single game, um, but the possibility of that being on the table, right? Almost like the Royal Flush in poker or something. You know, you're, you're not going to see it often, but... You know, when you get close to it, or whole, you know, holy cow, that's going to be a, a memorable moment in a game that otherwise uh, maybe is, is a little bit kind of just a flat in terms of the game arc. And I, I haven't played Captain Flip, but it, so correct me if this is wrong, but there, I, I believe there's a there's like a limited number of each tile type in the game, and so uh, while you're playing, if you see another player that has a bunch of the specific type, the, the gunner tile, does that impact how other players might make some choices about gunners? I think it definitely could. If I saw a lot of people drawing mm -hmm. tiles early and they had gunners on the face and they flipped right. them or if they flipped into them, I know the chances of there being more gunners in the bag go down, especially yeah. at higher player counts. That's something you can look for. And I think that makes for really fun decisions, decisions too, where you can opt to play a little bit riskier knowing I'll probably be safe here. Um, but, you know, tiptoeing around danger. Yeah. Um, Jamie, do you want to go into your example for this one? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the game that I thought of thinking about this is Planet Unknown, which is largely a, a heads down polyomino, not tableau building, but polyomino placement game with an engine building, engine building elements where you're drafting these tiles from a public, uh, I've called it an industrious Susan here rather than a lazy Susan. Uh, you're placing a, a, a tile on your, your player mat and you're moving up two different tracks. Um, and I like, I, I, one of the things that I think of when I think of these low interaction games is that I, I, I'm often glad that they're low interaction. I want to really focus yeah. on what I'm doing and how clever I'm being with my tile placement, my engine building, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, Planet Unknown, I thought, does some really clever things to keep those tense moments in the game, even though you're mostly focused on your own tableau. Um, and probably the primary thing related to points, at least, is that between each player in the game is a goal. So if I'm sitting, if Brendan's to my right, uh, Jake's to my left, between me and Jake and between me and Brendan are, are cards that say that they're usually like majority style bonuses. Uh, they're looking for the, the player of those two players, not everybody at the table, just those two players who has the most of X or maybe the least of, of, of Y. Um, and you get, I believe it's five points typically if you have the most and then two points typically if you have the least um, or, or, or not the most there, but you maybe reach a threshold. And I, I just thought that was a really clever element of keeping some tension, some reasons to pay attention to the other players at the table throughout the game. It does also do a few other things that are not related to points, although one of them actually is, is uh, there's the race to get to the tech cards. There's a common pile of tech cards at, I believe, four different tiers for all players at the table. And once you reach a certain tech level, you just get to, you get to look through all the cards. There's no random element. You just get to look through the entire stack of level one techs, for example, and choose one of them. Um, and so if you're the first to take that, no one else can take that tech. And then there's also the player, the active player is the player who is turning the industrious Susan towards themselves. And that orientation impacts the choices that all other players have. Not really a, a moment of tension in the game, but a moment of, of interaction, at least. I love this example, these examples, Jamie, especially the ones where the, you sort of have the, the left right goals. Because I think that that leads to moments at the table where you have players who are having an interaction, maybe that there's a moment, right, where someone wins that at the end. Someone gets really excited. And I, maybe I'm sitting all the way across the table and I don't exactly know what happened, but I know they're having fun. To me, those can make a game that is low interaction, give you this sort of shared experience and make it feel a little bit more alive at the table, which I like. Sort of in Seven Wonders, that'll happen sometimes too, where across the table, someone passes over a fistful of money. And because in that game, you can just trade on your left and right. And I, I like those moments because 
there's something fun about when a game that's low interaction is happening, it feeling like there's this sort of buzzing energy, even when I'm not involved, right? I'm mostly focused on what I'm doing, but I'm excited that other people are having fun or having an, an interesting interaction. And that actually makes my fun of the game increase or my estimation of the fun I'm having in a really sort of nuanced psychological way, I think. Where it's sort of like, oh yeah, it seems like we're all really enjoying this. I'm really enjoying this too. Yeah. And I kind of disagree a little bit that the rotating the industrious Susan doesn't lead to tense moments. Okay. I find yeah. when I play the game, I played it a couple of times on Board Game Arena live with you know friends over voice chat. And I, I feel like in those experiences, it's right after the tile board has been rotated that I that people are shouting out, you know, how could you do this to me <laughs> specifically? You know, or just any, you know, you're please just not this one bay of tiles, anything but that. And then of course that's the one you get dealt. Um so I, I think there is a good sense of tension there. And I, I that's my personal probably favorite mechanism in that game that that differentiates it from other sort of player personal player board polyomino games and and i think for me at least i find kind of a real delicious tension in there especially later in the game when you're trying to just fit in one or two more pieces it fits nicely for a low interaction game too because in terms of the decision space you're not usually considering what the consequences of you choosing the tile you want is going to affect everyone else at the table at least in a multiplayer version of this game which is kind of nice because it still gets to be in a low interaction from a decision space perspective i'm usually just thinking about what i care about but then if i get to host jake along the way feels good. Or at least it feels exciting and gives you that sort of tense moment. <laughs> I'm going to jump in with my example here, and I've just got a quick one. Um, so for me, one thing, one, I think, ingenious solution to uh, low interaction games lacking tense moments is the way uh, in Steffenfeld's The Castles of Burgundy, you have diminishing points for completing areas throughout the game. Um, and I think the reason this is so great is because the actual infrastructure of the game, the you've, you've got five ages, each within five turns, it gives players a real sense of uh, whether or not they're re kind of on pace. You know, at the start of each age, I'm thinking to myself, maybe I can complete this area over here and this area over here. And then when you get to the end of that age, I've either scored those for, you know, the most points I'll ever be able to receive for them in the game, or I've you know, been inefficient, messed up, didn't get the dice I needed and fall off the pace. So I think just having that sort of rigid structure of, of diminishing points gives players really tense moments at the end of each of those rounds where even though they're not competing against each other, uh, you still feel, you know, uh, really strong feedback of did I do the thing I was trying to do or did I not? Uh, and so that for me is an one ingenious way to kind of solve this problem without a lot of extra rules, bloat or overhead. And I do like in, in that game, th there are other games that have that where it's like the first player to score something gets extra points. That might even be in castles in another area. But I like that th in that example, it's just everyone knows those point tiers. I can't impact how that point tier if it impacts you. We all have the, a, a fair chance at getting that same point tier each round. Yeah, I think definitely. That works out well. I think that works out well too. And it's, it, as Jake mentioned, sort of seeing and being able to pace with other people, but knowing that I'm just trying to keep up in a way, you feel like you're running the race to fill in your board. So you get that tension and it's this little, we talked about how usually you don't get scoring feedback in these low, uh, low interaction games mid pace, but this is a way in which you do. And it sort of says, okay, Jamie, you did great. You, you finished these two regions. Here's 20 points for doing that. in the first one It's these nice little bumps of feedback as you're going. I also like in castles that you have this scoring usually juxtaposed with other scoring mechanisms that you're more likely to get points for later in the game. So as this point outlet is trending down, you have other ones trending up. So as the excitement of finishing a region sort of wanes as the game goes on, you have other goals that you're building towards that are sort of waxing as the game goes on. And that gives the scoring this nice arc where you're actually just trying to keep your threshold up and keep scoring as obviously as much as you can as the game goes on. But it, it's fun when you do that well and you never really feel, I'm not great at castles, so I feel the dip. I never finish my regions early and I'm sort of like, I'm behind. But when you make it happen, it feels great. Well, I think that's a great segue right into our next design problem in board games. Um, Brenda, you're talking about the different objectives coming in at different points in the game in Castle of Burgundy. So one problem that we can face as designers or players uh, is a sense of extreme complexity around competing objectives. When I mean, how many of us have been in a situation where you 
get taught a brand new board game. Maybe it's a Euro game. There's a lot of stuff going on the board and you start taking your first turn and you just have no clue. Like, what should I be going for? Which direction should I be moving down? So that's the problem we're addressing here, which is that games with too much different scoring opportunities can feel kind of confusing, opaque to players. And let's change up the order this time. Um, and maybe, Jamie, do you want to lead us off and, and, and talk about your example? Yeah, a recent example of, of this that came to mind is the game Let's Go to Japan, which I believe came out in, earlier in 2024 from AEG. Um, I've really enjoyed my plays of the, of the game so far. It's a game about planning a six-day trip to Japan where you're doing six activities each, or I'm sorry, three activities each day, each represented by a card. And on every card, there is a unique scoring opportunity. And it it's out of, I think it's around 150 cards. It's a lot of different cards, a lot of different ways that you can score points. It's the type of thing where a card might say, if you have seven resources, so f- uh, seven experiences so far of a certain type so far this week, then you get 10 points. That, that sort of sto- uh, threshold-based scoring um, goals. Um, and the game does something that I thought was really clever that prevented me or prevents me when I'm playing from being too overwhelmed by the sheer number of ways I can score points on those cards. And that is that as you are planning these days, whenever you gain a card, you are going to put it on a day. So you're choosing which day to put it on. And the order matters because we're going to go on this trip from starting from, I think, Monday or Sunday, all the way through Friday or Saturday. Um, And the order in which you put it on that day matters too. So if I already have a card on Monday and I want another card there, I can either put it behind that card that I already have or on top of the card that I have there. And at the end of the game, you'll have a full three activities per day. And the highlight of the day is the card that is fully visible, fully revealed on uh, kind of the, I'll say the top of the stack. It's the fully, fully visible card. And it's only that card that at the bottom of that card has the scoring unique scoring revealed. So throughout the game, you're making decisions about which card you might end up uh, scoring at the end of that particular day. So you only end up having six cards out of the total of 18 or more. And sometimes there can be a few more, but usually it's around 18. Six of those 18 will be the ones that you actually score throughout the day. So I really like that the game, this whole element of having a highlight of your day, I think works thematically really well. It's the thing that you want to end your day with on this special travel day in Japan and mechanically that that becomes the scoring goal that you need to focus on for each of those days rather than a, 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 hu- a much larger number of scoring goals to think about. Yeah, that's really awesome. It's anything that helps give you a little bit of focus in in games like this helps a lot. And that sounds like a, a novel an interesting way to do it. And I love the thematic tie-in of it being the sort of primary focus of your day. I think, Jamie, the designer of this game, Let's Go to Japan, is also the designer of Santa Monica, um, which also has a ton of different objectives going on all at once. Um, and it sounds like in that game, I found like I found that it was really difficult to know where to focus. Not that mm-hmm. a game has to do this, right? Like this is a problem that a game can choose to solve if it wants to based on the feel that it's going for. But it sounds like this is one I'd love to try based on that that example slightly off topic like having spent i know you've spent some time in japan does that elevate this game for you do you feel like any kind of uh you know nostalgia when you're playing it absolutely yeah i have a strong thematic connection to the game i studied abroad there i'm going there in a few months for just a a fun trip and so um yeah we've actually been using the game to actually play in a trip to japan and and it works out It, it does a very good job of doing that yeah wow that's really cool that's a big win when you can have this sort of life impact of tipping off ideas um yeah jake did, did, has that happened to you with bonfire your example <laughs> yeah right absolutely <laughs> yeah every time i go to like my uh i don't know gnomish psychedelic enclave uh, yeah, planet trip right. out there i like to prep with a game of bonfire so uh for me i'm going for a solution to this problem going back to the well uh with stefan feld again um which maybe highlights sort of my process where I kind of think about a game I really love and I think, okay, wait, does this, how does, how does this game, uh, 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 you know, get around this problem and, and bonfire jumps out because if you're not familiar with it, it's a game that has a ton of different scoring objectives that takes up most of the main board in the middle of the game. And then you sail on around on a boat to different islands, uh, to pick up different objectives that you'll then try to complete. So it's sort of like a choose your own adventure, uh, of 
different objectives. Some are short, some are medium, some are long, worth varying amounts of points. But the whole thing can be pretty overwhelming to look at. Which of these objectives should I go for first? Uh, how am I going to pick my way through this game? So it's a pretty good example, I think, of a game with just a ton of overwhelming scoring objectives. And I think Steffenfeld really known for um, making games sort of in the point salad style, where no matter what you're doing, you're probably scoring points in one way or another. And that's absolutely the case here. And I think the reason that... Um, his games in that vein work so well for me is that the multitude of scoring opportunities are almost always paired with a really fun and interesting action selection efficiency puzzle. And I think that solves the problem for me of too many uh, objectives competing with each other because I can just focus on the trying to do well with the action selection efficiency puzzle and then just you know, score points as I can, you know, see how they fit in, but focusing first and foremost on the action selection part of the game. And in Bonfire, the way that works is you have your own player board and you're doing kind of a uh, a tile placement puzzle there where you have these uh, rectangle tiles that show three different action squares on them. And you're trying to put them uh, on your personal player board so that many like colored squares are touching each other. And that'll mean you'll get more action points to use in those spaces. So you can kind of let the action selection lead you through the game. Um, And I think that is a a fun way to play this type of game that allows you to kind of get out away from feeling overwhelmed by all the things you could possibly be doing. It's really neat too, how you get to opt into uh, more or less of these scoring objectives too, is you can go to the different islands at the top, almost like it's a buffet for your salad objectives. You know, I'm going to add this tomato scoring to my board. And when I played Von Fire, I've probably played it maybe eight times. I found that it was a nice way to onboard me to the game where in my earlier plays, I could focus on the ones that were identified as being easier and maybe focus on some of the same types. Uh, and then as they played more and more, seeing how the different mechanisms fit together, looking at the action selection, like you me- uh, pointed out, Jake, lets you kind of look towards what you will be able to do in the future of the game as you see sort of all of these tiles laid out for you uh, that you're ever going to see in the whole game and kind of ramp up. It makes it feel more attainable because you can set, sh- set your own pace. Though we should mention those tiles you're collecting are only like one of seven things you'll be scoring at the end of the game. Right. This is true. This is true. <laughs> Jamie, have you played this one? I haven't played it, but I like the way you all are describing it. I, I love when games give you opportunities when you don't understand the game yet to just do some things that that yeah. don't set you too far back and they they uh i don't know they they give you some sort of forward forward direction and forward progress um and then as you get to know the game better as you said brendan that you can make choices beyond that and so i, I sounds like bonfire might be my style of game given that i'd, I'd love to teach you one. sometime yeah that'd be gross that'd be great so the game that I thought of that solved this problem really elegantly uh, is Namalia. Is this this is one we talked briefly about on the show? It's a new tile laying game uh, in which the tiles that you're using are cards, and the core mechanism is that you're going to be laying these card sort of tiles uh, on top of one another throughout the game. So your sort of tiled play space is going to shift as the game goes. You're going to be covering up certain parts of them uh, to reveal other pieces. And there's rules about how much you can cover. Uh, and those cards show different types of animals. So at the beginning of each game, there's also objectives assigned to A, B, C, or D. Uh, so maybe you'll have the A will be having, say, I don't know, your polar bears next to pandas. So you know that whenever a round come up, comes up where the A's are being scored, you always want to make sure you have as many polar bears next to pandas, but those shift throughout the game. So maybe the first round it's A and B, then it's A and C, A and D. Cartographers is another game that uses a similar sort of style where you're saying over the course of the game, you're going to care about all of these things, but this round, you're just going to care about these two. And you can, I, I think these do a really good job when you have this sort of shifting or progressive objectives of sort of saying to the player, just focus on these. But as you get better, like you were mentioning, Jamie, you can sort of see, okay, my planning from round to round, the way I'm going to get better at this game is setting up in the rounds where I don't care about something, these objectives in terms of the points I'm receiving about setting those up for the future. And I found that in Amalia, 
it just gives you this really wonderful sense of planning where you can actually feel quite clever because you'll lay down a tile that maybe negates a scoring objective for a future round. It'd be something you really don't want, but you know, okay, I have this round and next round to try to cover it up and solve that problem for myself. And I think that that leads to this really fun gameplay loop of creating these little risks for yourself and then hoping that you can solve them. Uh, or, or like I mentioned, because of the puzzle of it and covering things up, it, you can just, it leads to things that feel a little bit more clever in their solution because it's less direct than just laying a tile down and achieving something. It's sort of laying a tile down, covering it up and setting something else up on the way. So I, Namalia is for me one of the best examples of this that I've seen where the variable round round scoring gives you focus and doesn't leave you too overwhelmed, but gives you things to chew on as you get used to playing. And you mentioned cartographers as well. And there's Isle of Sky, which is the first time that I'd ever seen it. I, I think it's one of the best round based scoring systems that games can have. Yeah. Just because of the, how you're, you're pairing usually two, sometimes three, but usually two different goals together per round. And exactly like you said, like you can, that lets you plan ahead, plan just for the current round if you want, or you can look ahead at what those fi- those later goals are and plan around them and decide in Namalia not what to over, what not to overlap or what to overlap and not worry about. And yeah, and just the idea of any game saying at any time, oh, you don't have to worry about this anymore. It's kind of yeah, nice. It feels like, so good. We're done yeah. with the A scoring. You don't, don't, don't think about those forests anymore or, or those pandas. Yeah. Yeah. I think that works really well. I've played uh, Isle of Sky a couple times recently, revisiting it, and it's such a great time. Um, I think what an epiphany I had with with it recently around the scoring system is not only does it uh, add variability to the game by whichever ones you draw out, but even the order that they come out in matters a ton. You know, if you have one that involves completing regions and that's in the first spot, A spot versus the D spot or whatever like the impact and the value of going for that in the game is going to be very different. And I learned that by uh, making a big error about going way too heavy on that strategy on something that was in the A spot and halfway through the game and I have no more scoring potential. Um, So yeah, agreed. Great example. Cartographers does that too. And I find it's really fun. The more you play that game to think about, just look at the objectives and sort of interpret the shape of the game and kind of think through, okay, this game based on these objectives, this is the strategy I want to push for. And maybe it won't happen based how the cards come out, but I think it's a nice way to make a game with variable scoring objectives feel really different every time, Uh, which typically these games don't suffer from that problem. But when you can take that and make it stand out as a mechanism, I don't know there's a lot of value there. All right, should we move right along into our third problem, which is a classic one, uh, probably very familiar to folks listening to this if you're a board game enthusiast, and that's too much downtime. Um, and and I, the way I'm thinking about this is other players are going, you're waiting for it to get back to you, and it's just taking a little while. Is that how y'all interpreted this as well? Yeah, definitely. For me, too much downtime just means that as I'm playing the game, between my opportunity to act in that game in some way, shape, or form, to have agency over what the game state looks like, I'm finding myself disengaging because either I don't have things to think about or I'm just not doing anything. Maybe the game state changes too much between when I take a turn and when I, it gets back to me, so I can't even sit there and think about what I want to do because it, the game will be so different. So I'm just maybe disengaging a little bit. Well, I haven't gone first yet, so I'm going to take the first stab at this one. And one solution to this problem that I really like is when games give you the Mm. opportunity sometimes to earn or just get variable amounts of income on other players' turns. I always find that exciting, and there's some really classic examples of this. Uh, One that probably will be familiar to almost everybody listening to this is in uh, Settlers of Catan, where no matter whose turn it is, when the dice are rolled, you have a chance to potentially get yeah. income. And that's exciting. Uh, and, and it always makes me kind of lean in when somebody else is rolling the die because, hey, I might get something out of it. Um, other games that do similar stuff, I think it's actually something I've noticed uh, quite a bit in Stone Meyer games. So Wingspan and Apiary are both games that have cards that when played or activated... Uh, means you're getting something being the person activating the card, you're getting the best something, uh, but then everybody around the table is getting something as well. So there's, uh, I think they're the seed cards in Apiary, Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong, where uh, when you play it down, you might get to look at 
you know, five different things and you take the one you want and then a, a mini draft around the table for everybody else. Um, and one, one final example of a game that has this, I played a, a game of Oracle of Delphi and that had a similar mechanism where you're trying to like advance up different uh, Greek gods um, up, up a track on your player board. Uh, and you're always looking at your opponent's turn based on uh, what they roll at the end to see if you might have the opportunity to kind of bump one of your gods up the track to hopefully get to the top and activate a really powerful one-time ability. Um, I'll draw a, just one distinction between this, which I like, uh, and something which I find a little bit less fun. And that's when like, if your opponent does something on their turn, you get to do something. And that to me, that feels a little bit less like a boon and like a moment of fun and a little bit more like I'm auditing other players' turns, uh, which I can find a little bit tiresome at, o- over the course of a long game and don't want to feel like, oh, dang it, like because I wasn't totally clued in 100%, uh, maybe I missed out on the opportunity to get something, you know. So that's my uh, kind of pro case and con case for variable income on opponent's turns. Oh, I was just going to add on to that that specific case real quick by saying that sometimes that can even lead to players not knowing whose turn it is, especially mm. if I can do something fairly substantial on your turn, if I can jump on there, it, it can throw off the rhythm of the game in ways that aren't expected. Yeah. I found Catan can suffer from that at times too, where you have to remember the only person who's trading is the person who it's their active turn. You can get be involved in trades when it's not your turn, but you're not the one sort of driving those. And I found that if, if the group lets that falter at all, the game can just fall apart. But that's another way that Catan sort of solves for downtime. It's just by saying, well, you could always get in on a trade potentially if you're paying attention and you're willing to wheel and deal. Well, let me just say neg- negotiation fits in here too. But for me, I, it can also fall in that latter case where it can just feel exhausting in Catan mm. if somebody's like really, really into the negotiation, like offering trades like 24-7 and you feel like you have to kind of like match that energy level the whole time or else you're just like missing out on stuff so that can be you know i I think that is going to be a really player dependent one but i think we can all kind of get on board with um hey sometimes i just get a nice little boon and that makes me like tune back into the game for a second you know i don't want to necessarily be a hundred percent using my brain a hundred percent time in game sometimes you know downtime a little bit can be okay you know to take a sip of drink catch your breath um but just when it gets you know, too much either way is I think when it can become an issue to some players. Especially in longer games, right? Maybe if it's a thir- sub 30 minute game, being engaged the whole game is going to feel great. But if we're playing a, a 90 minute, two hour game, yeah, a little break every once in a while to sort of take a take a beat feels good. Uh, to that point, Jake, can I mention the other solution you put in the notes? Because I think it's actually a really brilliant one. Okay, so this is not my answer, but I'm just going to quickly say A Feast for Odin, this epic Viking puzzle game, more or less, where you're tiling out your boards. Um, and tiling out your board and figuring out how those pieces fit together is a huge part of scoring well in those games. And Jake had put, uh, as a way to solve downtime, that you can tinker with the puzzle of how your tiles are fitting onto your board during other players' turns. And I love this because this is something that actually tends to take a lot of time, uh, is figuring out the optimal way to fit these tiles together. and Uwe Rosenberg sort of solves for downtime his game by saying, oh, you could just tinker on other people's turns. If you want to move your tiles around and figure out the best way, go ahead. Just let other people proceed with their, their turns while you're doing it. And it's this nice way of putting some game into this what would otherwise be downtime in the game. And I think it's this perfect marriage between having this kind of complex puzzle that could lead to lots of downtime um, and longer turns potentially, because you can do a fair amount on your turns sometimes. Um, and it kind of fills that space very elegantly for a game that otherwise would have too much downtime probably. The recent game Charcuterie does that to almost to the extreme where it's a tile placement game where you're completing a charcuterie plate throughout the game. And you can move your tiles around completely freely throughout the entire game. You have complete freedom to do that. And then at the moment the game ends, though, everyone has one minute after that to finish it. The game puts that constraint on it so you don't don't do anything during the game. You're you're actively fiddling throughout the game to get those tiles in the right place. I love that sense of freedom that I'm not locked in because I put this piece of sausage next to a cracker and I don't actually want that anymore by the end of the game. Yeah. yeah, that's that's really clever. Um, yeah. And then just the fact too that in terms of your decisions, you're not you're not going to feel paralyzed. Sometimes you can get analysis paralysis when oh, by making this decision, I'm committing to it. Having the release valve of I can rearrange this. I'll just keep we'll keep whipping around the table so there isn't a lot of downtime. That's brilliant. Jamie, do you want to jump into yours? 
Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, the example that I thought of was the, the fairly recent game Malem, which is a game about uh, players taking turns as captains of a ship where every player will load uh, one of their cat passengers onto that ship and that ship will, uh, the captain will steer that ship um, pretty typically as far forward as they want it to go. And eventually the captain might, or the pilot might jump off the ship and another player might take over as, as pilot until no one else is left on the ship. And as I was thinking about this, this problem, it, it occurred to me that Mlem is essentially, essentially a game with extreme downtime because you can go, uh, in like a five player game, I, I can go quite some time before making any impactful decision at all. I have the opportunity to jump off the ship. Um, and that is the main decision point that you have uh, to stay on or off the ship. So that is a decision that you have that cuts down on downtime a little bit. But for the most part, you're really just watching the pilot make decisions, um, roll dice and make decisions about which dice to use and where the ship will go. But in my opinion, when I've played Malem, that's a fairly entertaining thing to be a part of. Uh, I, I want to know what the captain is doing. I, I don't. I, if I'm on the ship, I don't want them to bust. If I'm off the ship, and that's where the the most downtime can happen, because then you have no choices at all. If you're off the ship, then I might be rooting against the ship. I might be rooting for them to roll poorly and, and not not go very far. Um, but either way, I'm engaged in what's happening on that ship. There's also a few different passengers that you can put on the ship that give you a little bit of a choice. But I think it's only two of those passengers that that give you a choice while you're actually on the ship. Um, so yeah, I, I, I thought Malem just uh, added, it reduced the downtime or the feeling of downtime. It's a game that has downtime that reduces the feeling of that downtime by making me engaged in what's happening on the ship. I love this example. It's so just because, you know, one thing that solves it is just make whatever is happening on the table wildly entertaining. And then you get to, you want to pay attention to it, uh, regardless of whether you're an active participant in the decision making. And, and I also just, you know, my favorite thing about Mlem is it, it's kind of what you alluded to there, Jamie, watching people j just switch their posture on a dime. You know, everybody's together. We're we're going to space. We're going all the way to outer space. We're definitely going to do this all together. And then you step off. It's like, your guys are going to crash. You guys are doomed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, this is, that's it. Mlem is a Kinesia game I have not yet played, but I would love to. I find Kinesia actually is a master of avoiding downtime and not always avoiding downtime, but keeping players engaged when they do have downtime. And he does this in a few different ways. So my example is also a Kinesia game and that's Babylonia, one of my favorite games of all time. Babylonia is a heavier tiling, heavier as far as Kinesia games go, heavier tiling game in which you're building towards, uh, you, you have your own personal set of tiles that you're laying out on this board that starts off very empty uh, and you're trying to score farms cities and ziggurats uh, throughout the game and it avoids having a lot of downtime by having these really incremental turns where you're you're not in any one given turn usually affecting the board too much you're just it's clear that you're building towards these more dramatic actions uh, as you incrementally make progress on your turns, you always score a little bit or do a little bit, but usually you know what your next thing you're building towards is. So when it gets back to you, oftentimes it's very easy to know where you want to put the tiles that are going that, uh, that you have to play. Uh, and then you build towards these very large, exciting turns where maybe a ziggurat's finished, someone gets awarded a, a crush of points, and then also they get a bonus tile that gives them 10 more points or these dramatic moments that I think make the game move fairly quickly. Uh, Sometimes if all the turns are just too fast, it can feel kind of samey and you don't have this sort of nice arc to the game. And I think building towards these more dramatic, larger turns that take slightly longer when someone plays this large hand of farmers can offset the pace of the game and give you sort of like the croutons in your salad, where you have this moment where it's a little bit different and it's something that you remember and it stands out. Uh, but overall, there's not a lot of downtime because turns are just flying around the table because you're not accomplishing all that much turn to turn typically. Yeah, I struggle with the kind of uh the micro turn thing versus the longer term so it, it's a nice case here where the game is mostly very short but then offers like moments where it stretches out uh you know where on the other side of the spectrum you've got a game like t call where it's every turn feels kind of epic because they're they're long sure. but they're you know the cost for that is tremendous amounts of downtime yeah. uh, over the course of the game as well so um yeah i think i think it's a cool example and also just push back a little bit on it being a heavy game because i 
I when when you taught me this game, I was like geared up to like have my brain, you know, just melted, melted. or whatever. But but it's you know you teach on the Kinesia eight, scale of weight. You it's teach in eight end. minutes <laughs> and play it in forty. It's not yeah. you know this is just for the listeners at home. I don't want them to get the wrong idea impression like I did um, about Babylonia. Yeah, absolutely. Jamie, have you played Babylonia? I haven't played it, but I I I really I, I actually do generally like games that have a lot of micro turns and a few combo tastic, really strong, yeah. powerful turns that stand out that are memorable. Um, we, we have a few games like that at Stonemaier, or I try to have a few, a few of those games. And I, I like games that do that. Yeah. For me, it just feels, if you have a game, it, it, there's no problem with this, but games that have all the same sort of turn structure, like T. Call Jake, where every turn is long, it can just start to feel a little bit samey. Or if every turn is really fast and short, it can start to feel samey. And I think it takes yeah. a, a fairly nuanced system to allow turns that can both stretch and be long and dramatic and be quick that's a that's not an easy feat to make a game system that can do that so whenever a game can if it works well beyond that i find i'm gravitating towards those games because every time you play when those longer turns happen typically are going to give the game a different sort of texture yeah yeah, if every turn is long and epic then maybe none of them are right i think (laughs) you know t call gets around it with the because it adds uh, it punctuates what's happening with the scoring rounds. So that's yep. kind of like your moment where it's like, okay, this is novel and exciting. And then we get kind of back to the grind. Uh, so yeah, to call if you don't do score it. midway through, not a game I'm interested in playing. <laughs> yeah, You're just building sure. towards the end. Yeah, it loses a lot of the excitement for sure. Um, Jamie, do you want to introduce our last problem that we're going to tackle today? Yeah, problem number four is about high variance during random draw. So if you have a game with where you're randomly drawing anything, I thought of it with cards in particular, but it can happen with tiles or or other random elements. Um, th- there's there's a lot of variance there. You may be looking for a certain card or tile that you don't get. Uh, you may get a lot of things. Uh, you might get a lot of things that you want, and other players might might not get the things that they want. Um, some general solutions in this category are like drafting auctions, um, a, a, a PAX card market, and there are, I don't know, these these can sometimes work, but they can also be a little inelegant, complex, or, or time-consuming, depending on the game. And so I think we were all looking for games that have a lot of this variance, which can be a huge asset for a game, and yet players don't feel impeded or uh, negatively impacted by the randomness and the variance. Yeah. Right, I don't think you've gone first. Do you want to, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jamie. One of the I feel and one of the reasons we want this variance in games oftentimes is it can make them even more approachable. If you have a a high variance game, almost anyone can often sit down and feel like they have a shot of winning. Uh, But the flip side of that is that if anyone can feel like they have a sense of winning, a player who's more invested and has played more might not feel like they their skills being tested enough. Right. So it's this tightrope balance that games with high variance have to ride. And there's incredibly skill testing games with high variance. Magic the Gathering comes to mind as an example. And then there's games more in the casual end. And I feel like these mechanisms and how games with high variance address these problems, you're, you're looking for a mechanism that fits the type of game that of the audience that game is trying to appeal to. And if you can nail that, oftentimes the, the variance, you can sort of set the dial to the perfect amount where you have the skill just where you want it and the variance at the level it needs to be to keep the game engaging time over time and maybe to make it such that you can play with newer players and show them a game that you've played 20 times without them feeling like, oh gosh, I stand no chance at playing this game against Jamie Stegmar. He's just going to wipe the floor against me every time. So the game that came to mind for me, and this is such a a nuanced little mechanism that could almost fall into the background, uh, and it should, I think. I think it's a good thing when it does for a game like this, and that's the Pinecone Token in Cascadia. Cascadia is another tile lane game. Apparently, we're solving the problems of tile lane games in our episode today. Uh, so many examples there of tile lane games. Um, but Cascadia is this game where you're doing, uh, you're trying to compete at these two overlaid puzzles at the same time. One of them is you're building a terrain uh, of dip five different types of territory i guess there's plains and swamp and and mountains and and water that you're laying out and each of those show different habitats of animals that you're laying out on top and the way the scoring works in the game is you care about sort of how big these different uh collections of terrain you can bring together are so you want to have say the biggest grouping of water but the other way is by having scoring these different animal goals uh and the the sort of they're always progressive so maybe there's always a bear one, a bird one, a fox one, an elk one, 
etc. Uh, but the further you go down on those cards, usually there's triangular scoring in terms of what you're getting back. So completing and getting to the end of one of these objectives can really matter. So for example, one of the bear cards might be you want pairs of bears. Every pair of bears that you have not touching another pair of bears is going to give you an increasing number of points. And to really score a ton of points for bears, you have to get all the way to the end. You want five pairs of bears. So at the end of the game, the variance in what tiles come out could be very impactful to your final score. If no bears are being drawn, that could be very detrimental. The game also then allows you to trade in these pinecone tokens that are worth one point at the end of the game to shuffle all of the animal tiles back in the bag. So you can kind of go fishing for the tiles that you want. And I find that if you rely on this a little too much, you can you can burn yourself and you might not necessarily get exactly what you want back. Um, but it's just enough to give you a sense of agency over the game and sort of say, well, I'm going for this. I think that if I can just draw this one tile that I need, uh, I'll get it. And oftentimes one is just enough um, and it can sort of make or break your play in a way that feels good. And also knowing when to spend your pinecone tiles versus save them and kind of maybe pivot into taking a different animal or terrain type than you'd really like to, compromising, uh, that can actually be really nice uh, game experience as well. The better you get, the more you can sort of say, oh, I'm making a decision around compromise. I'm not going to just blindly, pu blindly push my luck. And then that makes you feel good. because You've sort of said, I've made a way to make the variance work in my favor. And I think that that feedback loop of sort of learning to play Cascadia well is a nice one. Uh, and oftentimes, I, I don't know, I just think it, it sort of nails the dial. Also, it leads to exciting moments where sometimes you just need the seventh fish to complete your seven salmon run. You spend the pine cone, three fish come to the bag and you're like, yeah, I got it. Um, so that's good too. Do you find there's a sweet spot in games like this that offer the solution where there's too much refreshing that can happen and uh, versus not enough? Yeah, definitely. And I think that one of the great ways that you can solve that too, Jamie, is or that I've seen games solve it is by only giving you a limited amount. We also really like Renature, which is a Kramer and Kiesling game that has this similar, it's not exactly the same, but it gives you these cloud tokens that you can spend on a variety of things, but you only have six for the whole game. Cascadia lets you get, get more if you do this little skill testing element and push the puzzle. I think any of those mechanisms where they feel scarce uh, leads to it feeling even more interesting when you do use them. Yeah. What about for you, Jamie? How do you solve the high variance during random draw problem? Well, I I didn't intentionally. Well, I mean, I ended up choosing a Stillmire game for this because this game is somewhat known for having a lot of variance, but also a lot of randomness in the card draw. And that is Viticulture. In Viticulture, there are uh, four decks of cards, sometimes even five decks of cards. And you are always blindly drawing in Viticulture when you draw cards. Um, part of the reason I put this in the game in the first place is that because the, there's a fair amount of text on some of the cards in Viticulture. And I find it can be can make a game less accessible if you have a lot of cards with a lot of text that you're trying to read from across the table at different angles. So I try to avoid that. Um, but what I found as I, as I designed Viticulture is that if I made the cards abundant enough, so the mm -hmm. game is frequently giving you cards, you're often getting a free card in the spring, you're get, always getting a free card in the fall, and throughout many of the actions, the game is just abundantly giving players cards over and over again. So it isn't a game where it's difficult to get these cards, where it's a, so it's not like a big moment to get a card. Uh, rather, on any given a year of Viticulture, you're probably getting four cards without really even trying. So it becomes a game that's less about acquiring the cards, and a game that's more about choosing which cards to play, and even as you reach your hand limit, uh, which cards to keep in your hand from year to year. Um, I also... Uh, tried to design these vi the visitor cards in particular in the game so that they are good at various times in the game. Mm -hmm. Because when you have variants of card draw or, or tile draw, and you there might be, in some games, there might be a card that you draw early in the game, and that card is only good early in the game. And so if you happen to draw that card late in the game, then it's no longer really all that good. And so I tried to design the visitor cards in Viticulture so that uh, they are useful at any time in the game. Some of them are mm -hmm. still circumstantial, but for the most part... They, they're going to give you something that is good, something usually point-oriented later in the game, something not point-oriented early in the game. Um, so yeah, I think I, there are still people who play Viticulture with variants where they they put some of the, the Wine Order cards or the Vine cards face up. I totally get that. It isn't how I play. But I uh, this is the, the the kind of the design intent around it. And uh, I, I like the idea of some games giving you an abundance of things and letting you choose from those things as to which ones you want to keep and play. I think it's a, a great example. Um, 
with all of these things, I think it's been said already on this podcast, but just to like hammer, hammer the nail home, uh, you know, there's not necessarily, you know, there's not a universal problem with high variance. Some players like higher variance, some people like less high variance. Um, you know, so if you could have designed a viticulture in a way that, you know, you have 10 cards revealed or, hey, you could look at the whole deck and pick whatever card you want, but that's probably going to be, you know, there's some cost to that, right? It's That's going to be a way more time consuming and way more skill intensive uh, and, and things that you didn't necessarily want in this particular game. Um, so, you know, it, it makes sense to me. And I, I love abundance as being like one way to get around that, right? Where in Magic Gathering, I tr- get a chance to draw one card. And if it's not a land card, I'm in really bad shape. Um, you know, th- that's a place where kind of the scarcity of the card draw can can really highlight the variance in it. Um, and here it's mitigated. So great example. I think it's interesting too, because oftentimes it's the sort of thing where psychologically more card drawing in a game you could see how someone might think, oh, that means the game's going to be more random, but actually it's the exact opposite, right? The more cards you draw, the less random the games end up being because you're more likely to get the card you need the more cards you draw. Um, And then it leads to these more exciting moments. And then, Jamie, from when I've played Viticulture, oftentimes you have enough options that you're just trying to decide what's the best card to play play here um, rather than sort of looking at your... it, It works really well, sort of, you want to be presenting players with those options. And then... In Viticulture, you have a lot to look at on the board. So having the cards be randomly drawn, but then giving players enough that they can focus on them in their hand, I think it all comes together really nicely. Did you consider, uh, when you've designed games like this, how, what's your sort of approach to knowing, to being careful of giving players too much? Like, are you ever worried, oh, I've given players so many cards that the overabundance is going to, they'll lose focus? Or how are you adjusting for that? Yeah, I mean, usually I'm cued into that when I feel like I need to give players a limit on something. Mm. In Viticulture, there is a hand limit. Uh, Red Rising, there's kind of a soft limit. Uh, and sometimes if I encounter those sorts of limits, I'll, I'll I'll try to find some other way to address that because I sometimes those sorts of limits don't feel good. Like in, yeah. There are games that make it work. Like Concordia has a pretty tight resource limit as to how many you can hold, and that ends up being a big part of the puzzle of the game. But that... that uh, resource restriction puzzle isn't always interesting to me. Sometimes it can be more frustrating. So yeah. if I start to find that, sometimes I, I find other ways to work around it. I think that's so interesting. That oftentimes rules like that can feel arbitrary to you. So you're trying to solve it, solve those restrictions in different ways. That that makes a ton of sense. That's interesting. All right. I've got the, I, the last example, I believe, uh, for this one. Um, and it's something that, uh, so again, we're talking about high variance during random draw. Uh, there's a lot of mechanisms that we see all the time that are great mechanisms. Nothing wrong with these mechanisms, right? Doing a draft, but that can be time consuming uh, and and really skill intensive. Um, you know, there's there's card markets where you just have a row of cards that cost increasingly more. That gives players a ton of agency, which is awesome. But there's drawbacks, right? You have to read all the text. You have a lot to consider there uh, that can create more downtime. Um, there's auctions, again, skill intensive. And, and one other mechanism that I've seen in a couple games recently that I've absolutely loved uh, interacting with is sort of a, I guess what I'll call a card fishing mechanism where the game just says, you get to draw X number of cards. If you don't like them, you can throw back as many of those as you want and redraw that many. It's a really elegant uh, mechanism, I find, uh, plays really sleek you know you're you're doing it all on your own players could do it simultaneously um but there's a ton of really fun kind of gambling in there so two games that really highlight this mechanism um one challengers a game we've talked about a lot on this podcast that's how the kind of draft phase in that game works everybody simultaneously gets to draw five cards and pick one or two of those and throw back as many as they want um, in another game I've been playing a lot, I just traveled this weekend. So on the plane, I was playing Bellatro, uh, which is sort of a, a video game that is a roguelike game that's built around the classic five card draw poker game where you're trying to craft uh, the strongest hand you can uh, to ultimately play five cards. And I think the reason this mechanism is so fun um, is because it, for, for as simple as it is, it leads to tons of really interesting and I think very skill testing decisions. Uh, not that 
you know, it can be really obvious. I got five cards that I really don't like at all in challengers, so I can just instantly throw them back. But often what actually happens in practice is you get a couple of cards that are maybe like pretty good, but not perfect. And now you're left with a really fun choice of do I risk, you know, throwing back what is decent uh, for something better, knowing that I'm running the risk of getting something that's much worse. And I think that kind of decision that players are able to make makes the result of the random variance of draw feel much more earned where like when I get a good result in challengers uh, or Bellatro, I feel really smart, uh, you know, because I made that happen, even though, you know, I pretty much randomly drew the cards. And it, <laughs> yeah, you made you it know, happen, Jake. <laughs> and, it, but it, and, and similarly, right, if I, you know, run a risk and I don't get something good, I'm saying, well, you know, that's on me um, for making making that choice. Um so I don't know, have you guys played, I know you've played Challengers, both of y'all. Um, what do you guys think about this mechanism? I think it's something that maybe more games should should consider putting into the kind of repertoire. I, I think it works wonderfully when it's simultaneous. And Bellatro is a solo game, so it, it, it's always simultaneous. Challengers, it is also, I guess it's not exa- exactly simultaneous, but it's essentially simultaneous. I think it can really slow games down when it isn't. Because then everyone's just watching someone make a decision that they can't see, they can't interact with, going back to the downtime problem. Yeah. But yeah, I think right. when it's simultaneous, it is a beautiful solution. And I really like everything you said about it. You wouldn't Don't want waste. to fix Magic the Gathering by saying, like, instead of drawing one, you can draw three and throw back as many as you want or whatever, right? That would be... So not for every game. I, I agree completely. I really like these mechanisms because in terms of... I think you're always trying to evaluate how much any given mechanism is going to take the sort of cost to a player in terms of how much they have to think about and the time and the payoff in terms of the decision space created or the feedback for the player created. And to me, these strike me as really efficient mechanisms in terms of a lot of bang for your buck. It's a quick decision that's usually not too difficult to make. And then it leads to an exciting moment, oftentimes drawing more tiles. I mean, the challenges mechanism is almost like having an invisible pine cone you get to spend every turn (laughs) from Cascadia, right? Like it's almost the same mechanism. Um, And in Cascadia, it sort of works and I think solves the problem you were mentioning, Jamie, by you usually aren't going to do it too many times. And then also the tableau is shared. So the animal tiles, if, if I don't draft them this turn, maybe you'll draft them next turn. Whereas if you were just doing it with a hand of cards, like you mentioned, I just don't care at all. Whereas if with in Cascadia, I might really care if you, if you send them back because maybe you're throwing back three elk and I really wanted one of those elk to come out. So it's at least engaging me in some way when you're making these decisions that are, are shifting things. Um, I love this decision. I could see it being overdone. Um, this mechanism, you almost, could get it, it makes the decision feel sort of s- similar from game to game, um, but just enough. And I think it, it's enough to kind of carry a game. In Challengers, it almost is the game because you're making so few decisions beyond this in terms of you don't get to sequence your deck usually. Uh, you're not making decisions during the resolution me- mechanism, really. This is the decision that you're making outside of what cards you take. And for me, it's enough to. Ca- I love this game. I've played it 300 times. And this, this carries <laughs> the game. Um, so I think it's great. Awesome. Well, that will bring us to the conclusion of our uh, design problems. Any final thoughts before we close out for this week's episode? I, I just I, I love the spirit of this topic and saying that acknowledging that there are problems that some games can have, but it doesn't mean that you need to stay away from those problems when you're designing games or even pl- playing games. Like you hear about a game that has a downtime problem. Does it really or does it is it solving that problem in a unique way? Yeah. So I, I love the idea of uh, embracing these problems and finding creative and innovative solutions around them rather than just avoiding them completely. I think also it's so cool just seeing within these examples how different a lot of the solutions end up being. Obviously, maybe in the final example, we found a couple that are fairly similar. But oftentimes, I think good this sort of exercise for me illustrates that good game design is not about finding necessarily the best solution that in game design there's no best solution right it's the best solution for the type of game you're trying to make right and the the mechanism that works really well in babylonia might not work really well in viticulture it's about sort of saying what's the essence of this game and what's the problem that's going to make this game more of the game that i want this game to be uh, and that's sort of the next step of once you can make a game that's that's working well and functional how do you sort of take it and say What's the essence of this game and how do I turn that to 11 so that people sort of say, oh, wow, this game's really all of the, the pieces are firing together. 
And I think yeah. that's the fun challenge. And it's neat looking at games you admire and sort of saying, which mechanisms are making it work that maybe don't stand out. And oftentimes sort of these fixes, you don't want to fix to sort of be like, wow, look, they really patched that wall up. You know, you just want them to someone to look at it and say, oh yeah, it's a wall. Uh, I think these kind of mechanisms do that, but it's fun to sort of look at the patches that people can put in their games. Well said. We don't want a high, a, a, a low variance version of past the pigs, right? If I want a zero variance game, I'm not, I'm going to go, I'm going to go for chess, you know, and these are very different games that suffer from very different problems to some people, but obviously are, uh, you know, widely beloved. Certainly. When you capture with a knight, you have to roll your knight and see if it lands, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is the orientation that lands if you get to capture. Yeah, it's brutal. <laughs> Let's leave it there. Jamie, do you have anything that you want to, um, you know, let our audience know about that's going on right now at Stonemeyer Games? And also, where can we find more of you too? Yeah, um, uh, the Stonemaier Games website has everything that all the different. It is the hub for everything that that we do here. Our YouTube channel about game design, Instagram, uh, my my blog post about publishing and entrepreneurship, and our most recent thing that we re- recently released that Jake is actually tied to a little bit is Rolling Realms Redux, which is a sequel with twelve completely new realms, not before seen in the Rolling Realms world, which is a it's a it's a roll and write game. Um, with a, a bunch of different mini games that you combine together in different combinations. Uh, and Jake has designed a few of the realms in this game. So thank you, Jake, for contributing to the Rolling Realms universe. So that was just launched and will be have a retail release upcoming soon. Yeah, and we should say the ones that I designed are uh, kind of expansion packs that you would get individually, not included in Rolling Correct. Realms Redux. Yeah. Yeah, um, Jake did Underwater Cities and Potion Explosion, which are promo packs, not, not part of Rolling Realms Redux. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. I can't wait to get my hands on it. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jamie, for coming on. Always a blast to talk with you. Um, And thanks to everybody for listening to this episode. Uh, If you want to find more Decision Space, you can check out decisionspacepodcast.com or join us for more conversation about this very episode. Let us know uh, design problems that you've encountered and games that ingeniously solve them in our Discord in the discussion thread for this episode. Um, And until next week. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy playing some games. Bye y'all. Bye.